Hi. Uh, like you said, I'm, I'm uh, Joseph Marty, ecosystem engineer at Packet. Um, so wh what I'm going to talk about is partly uh, the story of how I developed the process uh, to, to create a better knowledge base for my solutions engineering teams. And I followed this process again and again as I moved between you know, companies, orgs, facing different challenges. And uh, I came to realize that this, this is a, a process that um, usually exists in some form or another between engineering organizations, sales engineering teams, customer success teams, whatever. And uh, I found that, that, that codifying it in this way has, has been productive. Um, we talked about my background a little bit. So these are the companies where I've done this sort of thing. And uh, the, goal, the goal for a lot of this, especially if you're an in infrastructure as a service or something where your product is hard to describe to your customers, making a better customer experience. Uh, your, the customer doesn't even have to be your paying customers. It can be other engineers in your organization. It can be people on your team. It can be whomever uh, you're, you're servicing. It, that, that developer customer experience that, uh, someone talked about this a little bit yesterday too, the, the difference between that. But I, I think you can, you, you can extend it to say that anybody who relies on your work is, 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 stands, to, stands to benefit from this. Um, it's, it's mostly about making the platform accessible to whoever is using it at whatever level they're using it. Uh, so, you know, who am I to tell you that your knowledge base is terrible? I, I, that, that's not necessarily the case that it is terrible, but sometimes uh, they're not treated as, as living documents in the case of documentation, for example, or in this case, what I'm talking about as a knowledge base is your team's collective knowledge, how you access that collective knowledge, how it gets used, how it gets applied. Um, needing, needing a quote unquote better one is just how, how, you, how you service that, that knowledge base, how you service that, that index of things that people on your team know, how you onboard people in such a way that you know what they know and you can, you can work in this collectivized way, which is super important when you're, when you're doing things like solutions architecture, doing things like DevOps planning, capacity planning, you know, whatever, whatever, that, whatever that function inside your organization might be. Um, in our case, uh, <laughs> the solutions engineering team at the cloud provider at which I worked, we, when, when I developed this process, that is, um, the issue we faced was that we were constantly responding reactively. We were responding to pages, we were responding to customer outages, we were responding to performance issues, trouble tickets, you know, what have you. Um, all the things that require, you know, troubleshooting and being on the defensive, so you have to kind of manage those expectations. And uh, the company at the time was facing problems of scale, problems of perception, so we were a very, small team dealing with very large customers, spending tons of money, building big environments that they, they kind of built on their own and couldn't, couldn't, be, couldn't, couldn't be the best it could be on top of the platform. They weren't leveraging things the way to, the, to their best advantage, which is a failure on our part as, as you know, product designers, as engineers, whatever. And uh, the problem of perception I'm, I'm talking about is um, this, this product had a reputation for being good for testing versus production. And, you know, and, that, and that's, that's you know, a stability issue. That's an SRE issue. And um, that was something that we wanted to work collaboratively with customers, work collaboratively between teams, take feedback to our engineering teams. And um, we, we found that we had to start asking the difficult questions about, about what we were doing. Uh, our team was three people, for example, uh, servicing a, a, a customer base of thousands. And, um, you know, is there a way for a small team to service a large cohort? Um, and how do, how, do we, how do we make these customer interactions proactive? And by proactive, I mean reaching out when there's not something wrong. You know, even if, even it's, a, even if it's as simple as, um, you know, emailing to check in or having some kind of active community where you can share demos and things like that. And, um, and when, when you are heavily resource constrained, those things all you know, sound great but are hard to implement. And so that's, that's where a new framework or formalizing the things that you know, folks often say to do uh, to address these problems uh, came, came into play. So um, I, I, I think that, a, that having a good knowledge base, having, having the ability to say our team contains these, these factors, these skills, these, these pieces of knowledge, this experience. Our, our team, for example, was made up of a systems engineer, me, uh, a security engineer, uh, 
you know, database people, distributed systems people, what, network engineers, whatever. And um, you know, oftentimes when you're working with cloud services, these these solutions are complex. They're multidisciplined. They're <coughs> They might be vendor specific if they're running, you know, in multiple multiple providers. So the way the way we address this, we realized we had gaps in our understanding of of each other and what the needs of our customers were, what our customers know how to do, and what they need help with. So we created a framework that I'm going to discuss in a second. I'm sorry, I know I keep talking about it, but um, the idea was that we would use this to smooth the friction you're feeling with frustrated customers who, you know maybe questioning why they even chose you in the first place. Because if, if it really was about you know, your competitors being better, they would be using those competitors. There's a reason they were using you, and understanding those, those reasons is important. And um, the, the, ability to, the ability to interface with these customers is what is going to drive the sustainability of your platform through these customer relationships. So I, I created uh, the theory behind all of this was that, was that um, Data, knowledge, and then wisdom were, were the key concepts of, of what needed to underlie this process, what needed to underlie every interaction we have. And they're going to advance through these concepts as stages. And the, the stages that they map to are discovery, iteration, and delivery, which I'm going to talk about each one. But the idea is, is that when we're having these interactions, uh, like, like a, a piece of sales literature I came across once uh, introduced me to the phrase, a leaving a trail of trust behind. So even if you don't make the sale, even if you don't solve the problem to 100% satisfaction, when, when you have that kind of productive relationship, the effort counts for a lot. And um, which is why being proactive about reaching out gives them more opportunities to trust you, build confidence in your team's ability. So if you say you can't do something, they're, going to, they're, they're more likely to trust you and be open to other, other paths forward. So uh, when, when we talk about data, we're talking about the data collection of just all interactions. What, what's their software stack? What are they trying to solve? What have they tried in the past? Uh, what have they complained about on your platform? What, what uh, customizations might have you done? This, this is all just raw data. And in the discovery process, that's all you're doing. You're collecting the data. You're not analyzing it. You do not want, you do not want to try to contextualize it. You, you risk introducing biases, acting on assumptions. Um, and that's, that's all it is at this stage. You're just aggregating the information. You're, you're keeping a record of contacts, everything. And um, this, this can and should be done by everybody in your organization. So whatever CRM you're using, um, in our case, we built a tool specifically for this, which I'm going to talk about as well. But um, you know, having, having some way to create, to, to create a database of these metrics and what, what kind of interactions they've had with your technology, what kind of issues they've run into is, is going to be heavily clarifying. So when, when, you're, when you're ready to iterate this data and try to, and you're, you're going to repeat this process for, for, for every, every interaction. You're not, you're not you, this is not a one and done process. They might come to you once for, I'm, I'm experiencing this issue on Kubernetes on your platform with this CNI provider or this plugin or whatever. And you, you would run this problem through this, through this formula. So um, an iteration is probably gonna happen more than once. Um, and so basically what, 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 this, what this process is, is you're eliminating what's, what's irrelevant, what's, what's, what's noise. You're trying to locate the signal in all of their communications with you. And uh, through this process, you develop these new skills. You, each of you on your team is, is, is a shard in a, in a huge knowledge database, but, there's a certain, but you, you develop a certain amount of overlap, so you, you get better and faster at this as you iterate over things for a variety of customers. Um, and in this case, you're, you're, you're cultivating new knowledge based on the context from your customers. So the last stage is, is, is uh, delivery, which is when you're actually sitting down with the customer and saying, these are our proposals for you. Let's talk about it. Let's, let's, let's talk about the issues that you've experienced. Here are our conclusions about it. Is this something that you feel is, is an accurate representation of the issues you're experiencing on the platform? And these, again, these can be your paying customers, or if you're on a DevOps team, this can be your developers. This could be your community advocates, your DevRel people, whatever, whatever the issue may be, whatever the interface may be. Um, it's, it's, it's a way to introduce into the conversation that you've thought about this carefully, and uh, it's a chance for you to align, re, uh, recalibrate, rather, I should say, with, with the, the goals and intentions of the people using your services. Um, 
And like, like I note at the end, this is not the end of the job, but the life cycle of one component in this pipeline. Because what's gonna happen is they're either going to accept it and then you have to get on, the, get on with the work of you know, uh, creating a Terraform playbook or, or not a Terraform plan or Ansible playbook or whatever, whatever the, whatever the, the utility may be. Uh, you either move on to helping with implementation and then running through subsequent issues through this process, or you back up, you think it back over again, you maybe tap in different people this time. Um, you evaluate where maybe you, maybe you lost the thread of what their, what their concern really was. And um, I, I found that uh, in, in a situation where we're dealing with a, hu a massive developer community, a massive internal team of engineers, a massive you know, just customer base, having some way to track all of this in, in tinier manageable pieces um, uh, was, was an effective way to, um, to, to manage the, these breadcrumbs of, of issues that are you know, along the trail of their journey with your company. And, um, and that's, that's uh, really all that underlies you know, the, the, uh, the, the process here. Um, so, like I said, it, it builds into a process, it builds into tooling, it builds into, you know, functional roles for people. And um, when you enable a process like this, you're going to see people gravitate towards certain, certain parts of the process. In our, in, our, in our implementation of this, we had administrators and orchestrators. So administrators were the people who interact with the customer day to day. This could be a TAM, this could be someone in sales who talks to them often, this could be uh, one of your DevRel people who's working with a big customer. It's, it's whoever knows whoever knows their their environment best, who who is going to be you know this interface for for understanding or translating or you know provide additional context, not just the raw data that that we talked about earlier, the stuff you can dig up yourself, um, and it's just the person who's going to be the conduit in and out of your team to to this customer. And uh, we, we introduced the concept of an orchestrator, and this is usually a solutions engineering tech lead who will basically, you, 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 we were rotating in such a way that we were signing off on each other's, uh, on each other's solutions before any, any communication went out to say, this is, this is what we think you should do. We would not do that without you know, some kind of buy-in from the rest of the team that it made sense, that it was, that it was not going to cause problems for, for our, dev, our, our DevOps engineers, not going to create issues for, for you know, whatever, whatever other service internally it was going to, to start. Um, but the most important part was that we did document everything. We, we kept everything we ever, we ever wrote for customers, scripts, code, whatever, um, and, and all of that was, was, was kept because you want to be able to build on this knowledge. You want to be able to reapply it as necessary. And especially, especially in infrastructure, which is the space we were in, a lot of this stuff is going to be repeatable. So you know, if, if, they're, if they're saying they need a managed database and you don't have one, but AWS does, th what was the reason they came to you? So building something like that on, on top of a, a public cloud is somewhat trivial, but building it performantly in such a way that it can, that it can handle you know, RDS <laughs> level, level behavior, um, that's, that's probably worth sharing, probably not a unique problem to your user base. Um, You'll see in the image here that, that uh, there's a screenshot of, of, of our tool that we built to track a lot of this. And uh, we, like I said, we documented everything. We kept track of how many users crossed a threshold into a new spending tier, how many of them were boosted by our process, because this only, this only tracked users who came into the process. And um, we, kept, we kept track of things like rejection rates, completion rates, how many, how many of these users were already high spending users, and how many were users that we grew into being high spenders. So people, so in, in, in this screenshot, I know, it's, I know it's low resolution, but I'll give you some additional context here. Uh, we, had, we had two tiers of user at the time, VIP and non-VIP. <laughs> and non-VIP was, was you know, individual contributors using us for testing, and VIPs were organizations who had, of any size, deciding to deploy on us. So, you know, it, it didn't affect their, the, the type of service they received, but it was a way for us to know if, you know, are, are, are we wasting our time and theirs by trying to, you know, pitch to them? Or are there people who are trying to run on our platform that could be helped by this process and that we can forge these relationships with? Uh, the company I worked at at the time had, had an excellent developer uh, relations team. So these individual contributors were, were very highly looped into the ecosystem and we very much valued their feedback but it left a void with, with these, these, these customers who were the, the bread and butter of the business. And um, so being able to track just various 
various levels of their of their rollout on our platform was was valuable insight into how how the people scaling the most were were, were working. Um, now I, I know I've said I've 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 suggested a lot of things here, and um, there there's there were a couple of ways that we could tell if this was working or not. Part of, we we did a lot of things that initially were based on bad assumptions or perhaps we 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 had a bias that that made us think something was 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 foundational when really it was high, it was a highly biased way of way of approaching a problem, and. Um, so when the, the formula that worked for us was that we went with the conventional wisdom of tracking touches, noting how it went. We kept call notes for everything. We did visualization of, of you know, task status, how many users were growing. And then we, we uh, I, I used this last one, health score, as an example of where we went wildly wrong. And um, the idea of the health score was that we, would, we could, we could put users into an algorithm, basically, to tell how well their account was doing. and um, we thought we could be completely, we, we thought we could find a way to ob objectively evaluate uh, how well things were going and check maybe a bias that we were developing towards them. So maybe we thought things went really well, but they weren't really going well at all. So we were doing stuff, we were doing wacky stuff like uh, we, we contracted a third party sentiment analysis algorithm at one point to, to uh, comb, comb these, these call notes, messages from, from, from customers that got c committed to the tool. And you know, it, it, it sounds obnoxious and it really is, but, um, but um, it, it, did, it did make us realize one, one important thing that our perception isn't gonna be everything. We needed a lot of input to validate what we were seeing. And um, a big thing that turned out to be a big deal for us because our work with, we wanted our work with these big customers to, to, to be a, a part of the experience. We, we repackaged every solution we created and put it, on to, put it on to, onto the, uh, our team's GitHub separate from the, the organization's GitHub just, just so this was uh, a, lot, a lot less noisy for the people maintaining our GitHub. And um, we, were, we were able to, we were able to point, um, we were able to point people to these to these solutions that we had built in the past. Um, so, the outcome we wanted is satisfying, not merely correct solutions. You, and if you've ever done technical support, you might be familiar with this concept where you can you can fire off the exact right answer, and if they feel like you felt it was trivial, it won't matter that you were right. You have to make them trust that you're actually looking out for them, that you're actually that you're actually invested in this process. They have to feel invested. Like they're a part of, they're, they're part of the process. They have to feel actively engaged. They can be in, as involved or as uninvolved as they want. They don't actually have to be doing the work for you. But um, I've, I've found that even non-technical stakeholders value being a part of that discussion, even if they don't totally understand it. They appreciate the transparency. They appreciate that. It, it gives the impression of, you know, I'm sure we all work terribly hard, but sometimes that doesn't come across when you're working with customers. And you have to, you have to, I won't say perform it, but you do have to, you do have to know when they're looking for something specific and they're looking for you to look like you care. And you not, more often than not, you really do. You really are invested. And that's, that's really, that's, that's really the, the core of what I would like my customers to see when I, when I give them a solution, even if it's something that they ultimately reject. And, and, and and the, the, when they do reject it, that is a good opportunity to reflect. You examine your biases, you question the assumptions you made, you collectivize those findings so your team can have input on what a customer might have said to you. And that's, that's what I mean when I say that this is an ongoing living process. So we, we, uh, we, we talked about this process a little bit, the principles that the process is built on, data, knowledge, and wisdom. And this is successive, repeatable, and uh, the, the outcome, should you, should you try to implement something like this, is that you, you do see your team start to reflect some kind of you know, distributed database of this knowledge. We call it a knowledge base. And uh, it's not unlike a knowledge base for a software product. We have this index of all topics and, and keys, tags, everything. And um, it's just, it's just a, a, a faster, potentially faster way. And it's not right for every organization, but if you find yourself overtaxed, it might be one way of thinking about things to be more efficient. And uh, the last thing I just want to throw in there is that uh, you know you might be the customer-facing reliability engineer, but your other teams might not be. It's an opportunity for the other teams to chime in with this and interface with customers at least indirectly, and you know learn from biases they might have had that may be hostile, customer hostile 
once once it's rolled out. And so that's just that's uh, I, I found that this helped cross functionality as well, which is always a good thing. So I will leave you all with that thought. Um, we have some time for for, for do we have time for questions? Oh. Yeah, yeah, we've got some time for questions. Um, if you don't want to ask me a question um, it, out out here, uh, you can feel free to reach out on Twitter or LinkedIn, or I'll be out in the hall probably. Um, but yeah, any any uh, questions? Okay, I will I will uh, just proceed to thank you all for for listening to. Thanks, Joseph. To all this and uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Nice first speech. <laughs>